Hello, I'm Fernanda Ellis. I'm a UK chartered accountant, a Brazilian lawyer, and our firm assists clients in both countries with UK and uh, Brazil legal and tax matters. Today I have here Madeleine Young. Madeleine Young, hello. Hi there, Fernanda. Hi. And Madeleine has kindly accepted to uh, speak to us about how to get divorced in the UK, the procedures. And we have here top 10 questions that most Brazilian and British clients ask us about how to get married, uh, how to get divorced in the UK and how the procedures work. Hi, Madeleine. Please feel free to uh, introduce yourself. And thank you once again for accepting to be uh, participating in this recording. Well, thank you for inviting me, Fernanda. It's great to be here. Um, I'm, my name is Madeline Young. I'm a family lawyer um, in Reading um, in the UK. Um, I'm also a collaborative family lawyer and a mediator as well, dealing with um, family law disputes. Um, but it's a, an alternative dispute resolution process. Okay, fantastic. Lovely. And just so people know, we are ba both based in Reading, but we have clients in, uh, you know, all across the UK, we have clients overseas. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, so I have here the first question is how to get divorced in the UK. So how exactly does it work? How is the process? Okay, so um, all divorce applications now are made online in the UK. Um, and at the moment, the law states that you have to pick one of five facts to get divorced. So you have to um, choose one of these. So, uh, three of them are time related. So the first is that you've been separated from your spouse for five years or more, in which case the other person doesn't need to agree to the divorce. Um, the second is that you've been deserted for a period of two years or more by your spouse. And the third is that you've been separated for a period of two years or more and you both agree that there should be a divorce. Um, the last two grounds are more blame related. The first is that your spouse has committed adultery and you find it intolerable to live with them. And then the last one is that your, um, your spouse's behavior is unreasonable and you can't be expected to live with them. And actually that, that last ground is a very common ground in the UK because um, there's no consent required and there's no time frame either. Um, as of April of this year, the law is due to change, in actual fact, and there, there will be the introduction of a no-fault divorce. So people won't have the option anymore of divorcing, uh, choosing one of those five facts. They will have to do, deal with it on the basis of no-fault. Either or both parties can make that application. That said, we haven't had confirmation yet. Um, that the law is actually going to be implemented. Although the law has been approved, um, we haven't had any notice that it's, it's been implemented. So at the, at the moment, if people are wanting to get divorced, then they, they fall under the old regime. And um, if there's any sort of time pressure, then it's, you know, it would be um, probably not, not a sensible idea to wait until April because there is every possibility that that could be pushed back again. Okay, thank you. It's fantastic news that the law has been changed because in Brazil it has been the no faults for a long time. So right. when I first uh, learned that in the UK you still have this blame or you know reasons to get divorced, I was quite surprised. So it's fantastic that the law has changed. I hope it's implemented soon. Uh, yeah, it's you know. taken a long time. I mean, the last, I mean, the current d divorce laws um, were made in 1973. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> it's taken quite a while for it to change. <laughs> But by experience, I like to tell people that even if they go for the unreasonable behavior, it's something quite established here. Sometimes they can feel, they can agree between themselves for the reasons on the unreasonable behavior. So it doesn't have to be something too uh, horrible to be presented. It can be just some simple arguments there. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, I would I normally say to people that even the, the happiest of married couples can probably um, construct a divorce petition based on unreasonable behavior because it really is just those those things that you, irritate you about the other person. It doesn't need to be anything particularly severe. And you're absolutely right. If people can agree what the contents of the divorce petition are going to be before it's issued, then that really does pave the way for a more amicable separation. Okay, fantastic. Let's go to the second question then. Um, so this is something that happens often. I'm married in Brazil. So some people say, I'm, I got married in Brazil. We got married in Brazil. Can I get divorced in the UK? Should we get divorced in the UK? Yeah, well, very simple answer to that is yes. 
Um, but there is an exception on the basis as, as long as the marriage that took place um, was valid or is valid under Brazilian law. So the um, the general rule is that the UK will recognise foreign marriages, providing they are valid in the country in which they took place. And then subject to certain criteria, the UK courts does have jurisdiction to deal with divorce proceedings in the UK. Um, and the, the criteria is all to do with where the parties are living and how long they've been living there. There are two aspects, there's domicile and there's habitual residence. And depending on what which category each party falls into, um, the likelihood is that providing one of them is resident in the UK, then the UK courts can take jurisdiction and deal with a, a divorce following a Brazilian marriage. Okay. But the following question would be, will the UK accept my Brazilian marital regime? Because as most people who get married in Brazil know, we, there are four marital regimes and each type determines how assets will be split in case of separation and things like, will the assets be owned by both or would be a total separation and what happens to inheritance? So if people got married in Brazil and they picked one of those established regimes, which is similar to a prenup of some sort, would the UK accept that? Um, well, that is interesting, actually. And as you say, I mean, interesting that you mentioned the word prenup, because actually, I think that's exactly how the UK courts would treat it. So it, um, a prenup in the UK is not automatically legally binding, but it is something, it's a factor that is considered by the court when looking at division of um, assets. Um, the um, I think that the test would be that the court would treat it as one of the factors to be looked at. Um, and would want, and the judge would probably want to know whether the parties entered into that regime willingly of their own free volition, um, whether they had knowledge of the other person's financial position before they did so, so that they were making an informed decision about choosing that particular regime, um, whether or not the part, both parties had legal advice about that as well, because um, for a prenup in the UK to be um, binding, one of the criteria is that both parties have had some legal advice about what it means to be signing that or entering into that regime. But above all else, what a judge would be looking at is whether it's fair. So if it were a case, for example, that um, by following the regime, it would mean one person was completely homeless with no uh, financial support whatsoever and the other person was a millionaire, then the chances are that a UK judge would probably not be prepared to follow that regime. Um, but if it does produce a fair outcome and the judge is satisfied that both parties knew what they were doing when they entered into that, they had knowledge of each other's financial position and hopefully they also had some um, legal advice, then there is every chance that um, that, that regime could be followed. Okay. Unfortunately, much like a lot of family law in the UK, there's no definitive answer. Um, and there's quite a lot of wide discretion that the judge has in terms of how they deal with these things. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they're likely to accept, but it's not a guarantee that Absolutely. it has many factors to be considered. Absolutely. Thank you, fantastic. Let's go to the third question. Um, so, uh, as you commented, uh, often people decide that they want to get married and they, they, they want to get divorced and they would like the process to be quick. But how long does it take? How long is the full process? OK, so the, the current process, um, I, I, know I would normally estimate that it would take between around five to seven months um, to go through the courts. Um, the on, since it's been online, it's probably slightly quicker. I would say that the quickest you could get divorced at the moment would be around about four months. And that's if everybody does everything they need to do um, you know, very, very promptly. Um, one of the issues with concluding divorce proceedings is that most lawyers will advise people not to, to finalise their divorce until they've sorted out their financial settlement. So that can sometimes hold things up and that can hold things up by quite a, quite a long time. Um, the new uh, law that's coming in uh, will mean that there will be a, a minimum of 26 weeks from start to finish because there's going to be quite a significant cooling off period at the beginning of 20 weeks that the parties have to adhere to. And following that, there is a, going to be a further six week period before they can conclude the divorce. So, um, but all in all, I think it's expected that 
the time frame is not really going to ch change dramatically uh, under the from now and you know under the new regime. So I think probably it's a, a fair enough to sort of look at around about a six month period as fairly average in mm -hmm. terms of getting divorced. And you commented something interesting there that I would like to point out that you can get divorced here without having decided on your finances which uh, for us it sounds, how can that be? Because it's all part of the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would expect in Brazil, you have to decide on finances and children along with the divorce. It's not like split in the same right. way. Uh, so I just would like to clarify that you can actually get divorced here, but not having decided anything on the finances. It's not right. recommended. Yeah, it's not yeah. recommended. But, uh, that, that's right and one of the one of the difficulties or the, um, with the online process um, and, and lots of people are now dealing with divorces themselves online is that it, it there's it, it's not flagged up to anybody that they need to look at their financial settlement so a lot of people do think once they've gone through the divorce process that that's it that there is no financial link between their, them and their former spouse whereas actually that's not correct and as you say um, you can get divorced um, and conclude that but your financial um, claims against each other remain open until they've been dealt with. So that is a risk in the UK that that does need to be considered. Yeah, and a terminology, please correct me, but it's like you're looking for a clean break, isn't it? You're looking for that. Once you, you decided on something on those terms, then you know you really have split finances in the proper way. Yeah, I mean, a clean break basically means that there's no financial link between the parties moving forward. Sometimes people don't have a clean break. There, are, you know, sometimes uh, one party has to pay maintenance to the other party, but they they can still get a final order. Um, so there there will be no future, well, hopefully, no future dealings financially between the pair of them. Okay, and hopefully, it's a limited time as well. It's not uh, forever. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And then. Along with that, um, how is child maintenance or children maintenance determined? Is it along with the divorce? Is it separate? How does it work with maintenance of the children? It, it is most generally it, it is dealt with very separately to the divorce and very separately to the financial arrangements. Um, the reason being that the child maintenance service, which is the new form of the um, child support agency, have jurisdiction to deal with most child maintenance claims. There are some exceptions, um, and that's where perhaps one party isn't living in the UK, um, or the paying party's income is over £3,000 a week gross. Okay. Um, but if the child maintenance service have jurisdiction, then the calculation is a statutory calculation. There's no discretion there. So the child maintenance service deal with all disputed claims and it's kept out of the court process. As part of um, divorce and financial settlement, lawyers will quite often deal with child maintenance at the same time and try and encourage parties to reach an agreement about the level of payments. But if there is a dispute, most couples will have to go to the child's uh, maintenance service to have that resolved, mm -hmm. apart from those two ex those exceptions that I've mentioned. Okay. And uh, I'm going to point out something as well, that uh, the, the child maintenance uh, court, yeah, the child maintenance service, they, yeah. they decide on child maintenance. There is a strict calculation determined on how many nights uh, the child spends per year with um, each parent, mm -hmm. um, but it's not as severe as in Brazil, for instance. I commented before in Brazil, if a father or if one, um, one of the parents doesn't pay child maintenance that was determined in court towards the, the other, you can actually go to prison. It's quite a severe instance in the UK. It's, it's a different process. It's mm -hmm. very different from how we treat that. Yes, it is. Unfortunately, I think um, there are sanctions that the child maintenance service can impose, but it take it does take a very long time, and there certainly isn't initially any um, custodial sentences imposed. I understand in Brazil it's much much swifter, much um, more, you know much more effective um, form of uh, implementing the child maintenance payments. Um, but and, and also it's something that in the UK, if uh, child maintenance isn't paid. Um, the party who should be receiving the child maintenance can't take the matter to court to obtain uh, payment. The child maintenance service have to deal with it. And as I say, it takes them quite some time. They're a government agency and it, you know, it, it, 
they work are quite, you know, they have huge vol volumes of cases mm -hmm. and it takes them quite a long time to get through, um, to enforcement stages. Okay, so I can see how it's good. It would be good if they decided that along with the financial um, settlement, uh, so yeah. they can get uh, not the the service age, the ser government services involved, but they actually decide that themselves. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, right, another another question is about what happens with the house. How is the house split? What happens if one bought the house and, you know, the, someone was a stay-at-home uh, parent and then someone was working? What happens with the house? Okay. So, again, that's where the very wide discretion of the court uh, comes in because there's no one answer to that. Um, the house, um, I mean, in many cases, the, the family home will be the major asset of the parties, um, but it is only one of the factors to be, to, to be taken into account. Um, it is mostly treated as a matrimonial asset, so um, it's available for um, distribution between the parties, by which I mean it could either be transferred from one person you know, uh, to, into one person's name for them to provide a home potentially for the children of the family. It can be ordered to be sold and the, uh, the net proceeds divided between the parties in such shares as enables each of them to rehouse. So that doesn't necessarily mean that each party will have 50% because one person may have other resources that are available to them, including a higher income potentially, and therefore a higher mortgage capacity, mm -hmm. which they can then use to rehouse themselves. So it, it is every case will be slightly different in terms of what is likely to happen to the family home. Um, as a general rule of thumb, I would say that the more equity there is in a property, um, then the more likely it is to be sold because it will realize money for both parties that will enable them to rehouse. Um, but the, the priority, the first consideration of any case um, when looking at a financial settlement is to provide a home for the children. Okay. So if there are children of the family and realistically, the only way that they can be properly housed is to retain the family home, then that is what's likely to happen. Okay. Even if uh, the house had been acquired by one of the, uh, one of one spouse before marriage, would mm -hmm. that still become a marital asset? That will depend on various different factors, such as what other assets are available to the parties. Um, how long has the marriage been? Because if the marriage has been 30 years, but one of the parties brought the, the property in at the beginning, the, 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 the longer the marriage, the, the greater the absorption into the marital pot, if you like, that, ha that asset has become. Um, but as I say, the first consideration is to, to rehouse children. So, um, I mean, it's not inconceivable that um, a court might decide that because one person brought a property into the marriage and there's potentially not much else available, the marriage has been extremely short, but there are, there are one or two very young children. Um, the property could be preserved for a period of time and then sold. And perhaps the person who didn't contribute financially to the property wouldn't receive as much at that point in time, but it could be preserved for a period of time to provide a home for the children. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is very interesting. And I, when, when there are houses involved, I always tell people to book a consultation and discuss the matter in advance, especially because quite often when par people are buying houses, they have a deposit that's been given from one of their, um, maybe their parents or maybe one of the, the, the relatives is providing the deposit for that. So even if you got married in Brazil, you picked a marital regime, say separation. Um, if the deposit is being given by your parents or something, there are things that could be done mm -hmm. okay, when you buy the house. And it's definitely something that you, a discussion you could have. And maybe the person that's providing that gift would like to know how it works and what would happen if um, the house later has to be split. Yes, I think that would be very sensible. I mean, um, I think any any parent who is or, or family member who is sort of advancing money to somebody to buy a property, whether or not that person is getting married, actually, would yeah. probably would be well advised to take advice about potentially having a declaration of trust or something like that to protect the money that they are putting into that property. Yeah. Because otherwise, in the UK, there is that risk that it will just be absorbed into the matrimonial assets and 
and not be ring fenced for the person for whom they were intended. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, Okay, quite often as well, people have, uh, they, they live in the UK, but they have assets in Brazil, maybe assets that they had before they got married or assets that they inherited, one of the party inherited. So how are overseas assets dealt in a UK divorce or how are, part in particular, how are Brazilian assets dealt with in a UK divorce? Okay, so um, assets that are not in the UK um, are trickier for the UK courts to deal with because the, the UK court can't make an order which automatically is going to be binding in a foreign country so a court uh, UK court can't order the sale of a property for example in Brazil and expect that order to be operative in Brazil um, so what the UK courts will tend to do is um, offset those assets against assets in the UK so they won't be ignored and the um, both parties have a duty in the UK courts to provide full and frank disclosure of their financial position, which includes worldwide assets. So, for example, if one person has a property in Brazil that they've inherited, then they would be expected to provide a proper valuation of that property. Now, um, as I say, the, the UK court can't order that property to be sold and divided. But what the UK court can do instead is say, well, okay, you've got a property in Brazil, for argument's sake, that's 50,000 pounds in your name. Um, so rather than selling that property and sharing it with your spouse in the UK, the spouse in the UK can keep more UK assets to offset against the Brazilian assets. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not always going to be perfect because that relies on there being sufficient assets in the UK to do that. But then there are different other ways that potentially a, a court could look at redressing the balance. Okay, yeah, this is quite interesting as well because quite the culture in Brazil is such that very often in life, parents would, provide, would pass their assets to their children. Mm. Something that a lot of Brazilian families do um, that I see that they don't do as much in the UK. No. They uh, when they buy one house to one child's name, another, and they say, "Oh, this house is in your name." It doesn't really mean that they have given the house to that child already. They the house is still owned by the the parents. The children respect the the house or the houses or the assets are mm -hmm. owned by the parents. But the parents say, "Oh, this is in your name because it's an, an advanced inheritance." Yes. And yeah. then there are all sorts of discussions that can happen in Brazil. That although you have the land register the house in your name uh the house is not actually yours yet there are things usufruto there are specific things that you put in those houses it means it's still reserved for the parents so you can get into mm. complicated scenarios but certainly yeah. something that we could look at case by case yeah yes yeah, so that's interesting and actually i mean it's not that's not unique to brazil in terms of that kind of concept of of parents um advance advancing inheritance as you say um it's difficult for a uk court to get their head around that <laughs> to be honest because um in the uk um whatever's registered at the land registry is deemed to be the actual position so if somebody has the legal title <clears throat> pardon me the legal title of a property then without very very good evidence uh to the contrary then the uk court will follow whatever is uh, registered at the land registry mm -hmm. if there is um but interesting what you say about there being a um a sort of a way of that gift being made but actually not it's not reliable in terms of um law i can't remember the, the expression you used just then but yeah, right. reserve, so, reserve. yeah. Um, so actually that would be something that potentially some um if, if somebody were getting divorced in the uk and there was an issue about a property in brazil that was held in that way then some input from a Brazilian lawyer um, would be really helpful for the court in the UK for them to understand what is or isn't possible in the in Brazil in terms of uh, dealing with that property. Okay. Yes. It's yeah. good to do this comparison. Okay. Yeah. Um, so another question that we get often is, what's the decree NISA and the decree absolute? Because okay. I'm yeah. divorced, why do I have two papers? Which one is the sure. final paper? And also the decree absolute, is that the final piece or do I still need to do something else? 
Yeah. Okay. So, so just just to start off again, if the, when as and when the law does change, um, we're not we're not no longer going to have decree nice and decree absolute. They're going to be called different things because you know <laughs> um, we're going to have a conditional order and a final order. Okay. Um, so, but calling the, the decree NICI as it stands at the moment is some is actually called a certificate of entitlement to a divorce. So, um, at the present time, you get issued with a decree NICI when the court has reviewed the divorce paperwork and a judge has decided that the person who's applying for the divorce is entitled to have a divorce. But they're not making it final at that point in time. So they're not actually granting the divorce. They're just saying yes. I've read your papers and you are entitled to a divorce. Um, the relevance generally of having that um, piece of paper, the decree nice sign, is that parties can then apply to the court for a financial settlement or they, they can make, they can apply for the fi their financial settlement to be made into a court order. So up until the point that a decree nice sign or conditional order, as it will be known, has been granted in the court, the parties can't ask the court to finalise their finances by way of an order. I mean, they can make an application to the court, but they can't get a final um, financial order. Once the decree nisi or the conditional order has been granted, then the court can make an order about their financial arrangements. But of itself, in itself, it is just basically a certificate that you are entitled to a divorce. At the present time and in the future, you have to wait six weeks from the date of the decree NICI until you can apply for the decree absolute or the final order, um, which is another kind of cooling off period. Mm. Um, the decree absolute or the final order as it will be known does end the marriage. So that is the final um, divorce order. And it, as I say, it ends the marriage. Um, so, uh, and so you also lose at that point in time any spouse's right rights that you may have. So, in the UK, what we would normally say to people is, don't apply, don't finalise the divorce until. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, don't finalise the divorce until you've reached your financial settlement, because um, people who may be entitled under the other person's say pension or life insurance policy as a spouse would lose that right once the decree absolute or the final order has been granted. Okay, so you'd suggest yeah, the, the order would be the decree at night. Um, and then although you could go and get the decree absolute, you suggest first the final, deciding on the finances, getting a consent order for the finance. So something that really says from the court, this is um this is going to be yours. That's what happens to pension. That really decides the financial situation. Even if there are pension uh, spousal maintenance, it's mm -hmm. decided on this financial court order. And after that, you go and get the decree absolute. Because that, you do it yourself and you apply for the decree absolute yourself, uh, you run this risk of not having decided on the finances. And potentially, many years later, one person can still go and claim against the other person. Yeah. 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 That, that's right. I mean, there are some exceptions if you are the person who's receiving the divorce petition in terms of your ability to claim in the future but that could that that's quite complicated and um sort of advice in, in different situations would be needed on that but um yes potentially um you you know you may get divorced and then 20 years down the line you win the lottery and suddenly your former husband or wife pops up and tries to get a slice of your money and, and it has happened so <laughs> yeah I've seen the news it's yeah. so definitely it's, yeah. it should follow the correct procedures there okay <laughs> um so and also once a divorce has been done in Brazil do I need to register the divorce in Brazil once a divorce has been done in the UK do I need to register my divorce in Brazil if the person was married in Brazil please feel free to comment and then I can complement that yeah, I mean, as I say, in the UK, um, there's no need, to, if, if you were divorced in Brazil, and you live in the UK, you wouldn't have to register your Brazilian divorce in the UK for it to be effective. But I, I understand that is not the case in Brazil. So over to you, yeah. Fernanda. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so in Brazil, if you got married in Brazil, you absolutely must register your divorce. Even if the divorce was done anywhere else, you need to follow the procedure and register the divorce in Brazil. Until that is done, nothing can happen uh, in terms of inheritances. Even if the person got divorced, um, 
you know, in the UK and 10 years later received an inheritance in Brazil, it would be very, very difficult <laughs> to receive this inheritance without registering the divorce. So we always say, once it's done in the UK, just pass that through the courts in Brazil. Uh, they're not going to discuss the merit of the divorce anymore. So if you had uh, the, the consent order and if you decided on the finances, Brazil is not going to discuss that merit, uh, but you have to register there and it has to be through the higher courts. So it takes a few months. That's why we say do that because if you suddenly need to do something in Brazil and you haven't registered, then there is a long delay. Um, something as well in Brazil, if you're married, every time you buy a property or you sell a property or there is an inheritance, a probate, you have to get the signature of your spouse. So if you got married in Brazil, Mm. And uh, and then you're there, you, something happened with your parents and you need to sign something. You would need the signature of your right. ex-spouse. And then maybe you have you got divorced many years ago and they don't want to give the signature. So you open all sorts of problems. So you do need to uh, register that right. um, through the courts. And that's something that we certainly do. And we can assist and we've seen the Krenaisa, the Cree Absolutes. We know exactly uh, the paperwork you need from the UK to get that done in Brazil quickly. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the final question. And it's a very open question anyway, but how much does it cost? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the, well, there's a court fee um, for the online divorce process, which is currently £593, but that, that is reviewed um, relatively frequently. Um, people who are on a low income can apply to the court um, either for an exemption um, to that fee or for a fee remission so there's a sort of a sliding scale depending on what your income is um, solicitors um, if, if you if somebody instructs a solicitor to apply for the divorce for them then they will usually charge and the costs of that will range really depending on the different um, firm of solicitors anywhere between around about 300 pounds to maybe even a thousand pounds plus VAT um, but these days, unless the divorce itself is particularly complex or um, that you're anticipating difficulties with the divorce process, then a lot of people will find it more cost effective to manage the online divorce process themselves um, and save their money for lawyers for dealing with the financial settlements and dealing with any arrangements for the children. Because that's much more complicated and it's not something that can easily be dealt with in the same way that the divorce can. Um, and so uh, and it can, you know, can involve the parties potentially having to go to court and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, on average, if people use a lawyer, they're probably looking at costs of around about £1,500, something like that. Um, but they can reduce that if they deal with the divorce process itself, the online process themselves. OK, so they deal with the applications and then they leave for the lawyer to draft the court order and things more specific. And if there, is, there are arguments, you always uh, refer to mediation first as a first call to try to get the cost down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there are different ways of trying to manage costs um unfortunately some people end up in the court process irrespective of that but there's a very uh, strong drive to try and encourage people to reach an agreement these days okay fantastic this has been great and uh, i'd like to thank you and i'll leave your details on our um, youtube channel as well and i'm going to also later we're going to publish this uh, written on the blog so I'll leave the details on the description here. And if you have any questions, if anyone who has been uh, hearing this has any questions, please feel free to send those questions. We'll be back to you, or we might even do another video where we answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda.